Hey everybody, how's it going? I want to welcome you to the Silver Silk and More channel. My name is Neelay Patel. I am the owner, designer, and educator here at Silver Silk and More, and it is my great privilege and pleasure to be here at the Great Beat Extravaganza event and to teach a amazing project that I'm very passionate about and to dabble in the dark arts of bead weaving, something I haven't done in quite a while, but I'm very, again, just very excited to get to it. <laughs> um, real quick, if you're new to this channel, you can subscribe simply by hitting the subscribe button. And if you are on Instagram, please give me a follow. Um, we also have a wonderful, thriving Facebook community called the Silver Silk Silkies that you need to become a member of if you aren't. Um, there you'll find a ton of inspiration from our little collective group on what projects to make with Silver Silk and the latest and greatest sales promotions, new products, just everything from Silver Silk. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll quickly get to the project first. This is going to be a very in-depth and thorough class because there's so much to cover and it's very, very technically driven um, with the with the stitching and stuff. And so I don't want to glaze over anything. This is a live show, so anything can happen. And um, what I'll do is I'll save any comments and questions toward the end of the show. That way um, I make sure to get, cover, get the content covered first. So what I'm going to do is flip around my camera and we're just going to get started right into the project um, as, we, as we go through this. All right, here are the tools that we'll need. We'll need size 11 beading needles, which look like this. These are amazing, um, a must have needle. The size 11 beading needle is, I think, pretty thick and easy to use for a beading needle, which tend to be on the smaller side anyway. Um, but this is great for stitching, especially for starting. And for the type of fire line, which we're using four pound test, you can absolutely use six pound. I actually prefer the thicker over the thinner, but I also noticed that the thinner fire line seems to stitch better. <laughs> um, and it comes on a card like this if you've grabbed the kit. And I will cover the lengths of each section of our design, um, which I'll flash after I get done with the materials and explain uh, how much we'll need of, for, for each part that we're going to be making. Um, you'll need a pair of round nose pliers, which look like this. A pair of chain nose pliers, which look like this. We'll need some craft wire cutters. I use my trusty Lindstrom pair, which are great for craft wire, beading wire, beading thread on occasion. Um, sometimes I've cut memory wire with it, which I'm not supposed to, but I do anyway. And uh, they've held up time and time again and I are extremely sharp. So I really, really love these. Um, we'll need uh, beading thread cutters, speaking of, which I just happen to have a pair of scissors for that, that I use exclusively for beading thread. And then a beading mat, which I don't have on hand, but it is handy to have a surface to work on where the beads won't necessarily roll around. I'm gonna stick with my tabletop because I think it'll work just fine. Um, bead stoppers, which are optional. And of course I don't have any on hand, but they're good to have if you need them. Um, and if you don't, then that's perfectly fine too. These are my bent chain nose pliers, by the way. I just have those around all the time. Um, and then of course some Loctite jewelry glue. You can use E6000, it'll work okay, but I've noticed that the Loctite is quick drying and uh, I really, really love how strong it is. So before I cover the necklace materials, let me explain to you what we're making. We're gonna be working specifically on the necklace design. The reason for that is, is that this sort of sets the foundation for the other pieces of the jewelry set here. So more specifically, we're gonna be covering how to make these beaded end caps first, and then followed by the centerpiece. And so the materials that you see there on the right-hand side, it's just going to cover the necklace materials and then the rest is used um, for the other pieces. Uh, again, that is if you grab the kit. So we'll cover at the end, the earring configuration as well as the bracelet configuration, which you can see that this is just really a miniature version of the necklace. So that's why I think coming uh, to do the necklace first is a good idea. 
so that you get the foundation and the extra added technique of including that charm or bead uh, there in the centerpiece. So let's, um, let's cover those necklace materials right now. All right, we'll need some gem duos. These are amazing little beads that have captured my heart. I've never really used gem duos a lot in the past. And I had some in my stash actually that were this really bright electric lime green color. And um, I was sort of messing around and decided to stitch over some pipe chain because I didn't know what else to do with it. And of course the color was a little bit too strong for, for some folks out there. So I decided to sort of develop a different pattern around um, some other colors that worked better. But I, I know for sure that working with one hole that's tiny for a size 11 seed bead is intimidating. So, you know, trying to do two holes, it's, it can be tricky, but trust me, I'm going to demystify a lot of this for you guys. Um, it's quite fun and easy to stitch up. What I love about these beads is the bevel on top because it creates that sort of shield texture um, and it's three dimensional and it's just absolutely stunning when it's put together. As you can see here, in fact, when we were typing up the descriptions, uh, my friend and colleague Joan had, um, I think she mentioned this looking like a granite countertop, which I have to agree with. It looks like tile to me whenever it's all stitched together and it's so pretty and wonderful with the dual colors. So, you know, I couldn't just do the single color. I had to do two colors. <laughs> so I found a complimentary red set uh, that I'm nuts about, and this is gonna stitch up quite beautifully. Okay, so we'll have a few of those out here. I'm gonna just kind of start myself with a little pile of gem duos. And since we're going to be working on the necklace, we're gonna be working on the end cap first. So what that means is we are going to start by making one of these for the necklace. And this just requires a total of six gem duos per end cap. So count this stuff out before you start because you definitely don't wanna come up short with any of the gem duos and you wanna make sure that everything is kind of organized and dispersed accordingly. So there I've set out one end cap, two end cap as such. And then I'll just kind of put the rest away for later. Okay. Um, in total, it says you'll need 57 though, just in case you're wanting a more hard count there. A fire polish. So I found a gorgeous blue since this theme that I'm going with is going to be a coral reef. And for each end cap, you're gonna need three to complete, no, uh, sorry, you'll need six total, one for each side. So I'm gonna just count out six and have those set aside, but look at how pretty that is. It's got this great tavertine finish, so it sort of has a patina applied to it. it. That's what it looks like anyways. It's fully glass, it's check glass specifically, and it's just out of this world beautiful. Okay. Um, we will need some decorative beads. So this will be for that centerpiece. I just found this in my stash and you can kind of go as crazy or as minimal as you want to, totally up to you. Um, this is roughly about one inch in length and then kind of a half an inch um, in width. And so I'm gonna use that and I'm gonna use this little drop, which I've already wire wrapped with a head pin. Um, which actually brings us to our pipe chain and then we'll get to our findings. So for the necklace, I decided to go with a 20 inch necklace. You can make the necklace as big or as small as you want. We're gonna be using this beautiful aquamarine color pipe chain and what a color combination, right? This is not for the soft, this is gonna be for the bold lady on the go. <laughs> and, um, I just love, I love pipe chain. How it's created is that six latch hook needles stitch a single wire into a beautiful knitted sock almost right over a silicone tubing. So the tubing provides this robust, um, very structural centerpiece and the knitted wire provides something that's very intricate, um, gorgeous in detail. 
something that is machine stitched and very, very, um, I don't know, just luxurious looking, I think. Uh, every stitch is precise. And I think that's just adding to the detail and elevating the look of the piece here. So that is, um, again, just 20 inches is what I'm working with. You guys can customize to your liking. And then we've got uh, a head pin, which I've already used up <laughs> my drop there. So here we are, a little head pin. And um, let's see, working down the list, we've got craft wire. So the amount of craft wire that we're gonna be using for this necklace is gonna be divided up within the six inches. So you will need an inch and a half for, uh, as a cut, two, sorry, two inch and a half cuts. <laughs> there we go. Um, these will be used for the end caps. So have those handy. And then you'll need a piece to make the centerpiece. So you can use up a little bit of the six inches to do that. You will need to make a large eye pin at the end. And by large, I mean three millimeters, but let me double check. So four millimeters. The reason for that is that this is going to be slipped right over the pipe chain as such later in the project. Okay. The way to make this that I did was use my um, pliers that have the noted measurements on it. So whenever I slid this down, it came up to about three and a half millimeters in size. Um, so just have that handy. If you don't, you can definitely find it on your round nose pliers and just make it to where it fits the pipe chain pretty snug. And a simple loop is gonna work great. You don't need to do a wire wrap loop at all unless you really want to, but it's not necessary. Okay, so I'm just gonna set that out to the side. And as far as a length, sorry for that goes, is that you'll need about an inch and a half in total it really just depends on the size of the bead. Uh, for example, for this one, I'm gonna need a little bit of space at the top, but then I've got all this room and extra wire to work with to make a loop at the bottom. But it, as you can see, it fits my bead pretty well. So that's really the only thing I'm concerned about. And I just spilled my beads all over the place here. So keeping that pile a little separate. Um, and then finally, um, some jump rings and a clasp, which I don't have on hand. <laughs> and yes, many of you can laugh and know why that I don't have one on hand, because that's totally me. So there's a few jump rings. This will just be used at the end of our closure. And that'll look like this. So I might steal the magnetic clasp off this just to like have a completed design. <laughs> All right, let's get to step one, folks. So I'm gonna clear some of this out of the way and I'm gonna show you how I thread a needle. So we are working with Fireline. Fireline tends to be quite wiry. This is four pound test, which means it's thinner. This is going to work very well for those of us that are uncomfortable with putting a needle, a thread through a needle. Um, what I do is I kind of pinch the ends with a pair of chain nose pliers to get it nice and flat. And this works across the board for all the fire line. You can certainly use uh, one of those speedy thread needle threaders if you want to. I happen to not have one on hand, um, but they are handy. So actually I've got a needle setting out somewhere over here. Let me see if I can find it real quick. There it is. Okay, what I do is after I've pinched it with my chain nose pliers, I'm going to kind of tuck it in between my index and my um, thumb fingers. And then I'm going to place the needle hole right over where the wire, uh, where the thread was sort of pinched in. And then you simply just force it through the eye as such. If you're lucky, you'll get a few millimeters there enough to pull it through. And that's kind of the trick for working with fire line and how to thread it. Really, the, the trick is pinching the end with any sort of um, tool so that you get it nice and flat. And so again, we're going to be making our beaded end caps first. And so I'm going to have these beads handy. 
for constructing it. What we'll need first is our three fire polish beads, just like that. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and take it to the bottom of my thread, and I'm going to go up through those three fire polish beads again. So whenever I pull it tight, I'm going to get a round loop as such. All right, and I've got approximately two and a half to three inches of tail. And I've got my working thread. What I would prefer to do at this point, and again, this is just because I've written the pattern, is to tie a knot. And for some folks that enjoy bead weaving, you know that might not be their way, and um, that's okay. We all have a way to make a beautiful creation in our own way that works for us. For me, I enjoy knotting as I go along just to make sure things are gonna be held in place as I'm stitching. Um, I tied what's called a surgeon's knot. What that means is that you will tie one regular knot, which means just a regular overhand knot, You'll pull it tight, and then on the second round, whenever you do your second knot, you do an overhand knot, but you twist it one more time through the loop. And you'll see a series of twists. There should be a total of three. So when you pull it tight, it becomes locked in place. And I should have uh, shown you guys how to do that earlier, but don't worry, we'll be doing that plenty of times. <laughs> okay, once I've secured my knot, I'm ready to stitch these gem duos in place. The speeded end cap is truly the fundamental, really the foundation to our design technique. I'm going to set my gem duos facing up because this is going to make it easier for me to organize everything and to stitch it efficiently. So with the bevel side up, I'll know exactly which holes to go through. Okay. So I'll lift up my working beaded fire polish there. I'm gonna go through this first one without anything. What I wanna do is land between the two spaces, or I'm sorry, between this, the space between the two fire polish beads as such. I'm gonna pick up a gem duo and I'm gonna make sure I get the hole that's facing the bottom. And I wanna go in the direction where my needle is going to go through next. I am working in a counterclockwise position. So whenever I look at my gem duo and it's facing toward me, as in it's pointing up and down, I'm going to go through that bottom hole just like that and pick it up and then go through the fire polish. And I'll do that two more times. And you can pick up any color fire polish. The, tr the point is really to make it random. Okay, again, we'll just go through the bottom, make sure that the, the gem duo faces me, go through the bottom holes, and then go through the fire polish that's on the way around there, going clock, counterclockwise. So there we go, that's two stitched on. Okay, we'll go through that one more time. Here's an illustration of what I'm doing. Okay, so let's see, whoops. Again, pointing toward me, very good. I'm gonna pick it up and go through. There we go. Now I've got all three, let's see if I can find that illustration. Some of my stuff's out of order here. That's okay. Um, basically the idea is to get to the next hole, but I think I'm missing an illustration in between there. Number four, uh, that's all right. The show must go on, right? And so let's just focus on this. Now that I've got those gem duos stitched in place, the idea is to get to the top hole set. So when I've exited the last fire polish bead, as in I can pull this out and show you that my needle was going through there, I need to get to the next level. 
So to do that, I'm going to skip that first whole set and go through the second one like this. And that will only happen as you complete around a full trio set. So now I can resume stitching. I'm going to point my gem duo toward me, whoops. And I'm going to go through the bottom, bottom holes there. And I'm going to go through the top holes of the previous set of gem duos. And that's really the key and the secret to this, stacking those gem duos efficiently. Okay, again, I'm going to point the gem duo toward me that I wanna pick up next, go through the bottom hole, and then go through that top hole set from the ones before. And I'll do this all the way around. It'll look a little wobbly at first, that's okay, as long as you've got a pretty good hold and you know where the stitching is. That's all that matters. And we can pull all of this tight at the end. So here I've reached my last gem duo. And I'm ready to get to the next level. So what I'm gonna do is go through the top holes of that first one that I've strung on. And then I'm gonna just kind of casually pull it tight. And you'll notice that this is going to start stacking quite beautifully. And the last row, because this is our end cap, let me bring out an illustration here, is to put some fire polish beads on. So to do this, I'm going to first flip. We've done this. That's what we're doing to get to the next level. And now we're ready to put on our fire polish beads. So a bead is stitched in between each gem duo. Okay, there's one. If you want to, you can now start to squeeze this between your thumb and index finger. And what I do is I take my thread behind the beadwork over my index finger and hold it with my middle finger. It just keeps stuff out of the way. Okay, I'm gonna go through that. Boom, boom. And last but not least is our final one. So that is our stacked end cap. Until we put it through the pipe chain, it's gonna be a little bit squishy. <laughs> so this brings us to our last step to create our end cap, which is knotting it. So again, I'm very knotty when it comes to bead weaving. And the reason I'm not stitching through to meet this thread is that I want us to learn how to do a knot independently. That way, whenever we are stitching the bigger focal piece, you don't have to stitch all the way back through the design, through the beadwork to meet up with your other thread. You can just simply create a knot at the end. So to do this, I'm going to stitch back through all of my beads and the bead holes. So I'm going to go back through that first fire polish that I strung. I'm gonna go through the gem duo and I highly recommend doing this one at a time to make it easy. Okay, I'm also leaving a loop here. As you can see, I kind of secured it with my middle finger there and I'm just kind of pressing all this down. The reason for that is that's going to act as our tail thread that we're going to tie to. Okay, there we go. Just go ahead and meet back up with our loop there. So you should have a loop that sticks out quite a bit and then your working thread that have now met together. And what we're gonna do is basically tie all this together. So I'll just kind of fold this in half and I'm going to create an overhand knot. Now remember this is one, one loop through, give it a good tug and then do it twice. So one, two, and that creates our surgeon's knot. Okay, once I've done that, this thing is not going anywhere. 
So I can simply start to tuck all of my thread end pieces here. So what I do is I just kind of stitch back through the beadwork and you can go as much or as little as you want to. I recommend at least three to four beads. You can even kind of sew back through some of this stuff if you want to. Just depends on how much you want to do it. Um, but it should hide in there pretty well. And if anything, you can always stuff it in there with the pipe chain and it's going to hide itself, right? <laughs> so once I've done that, I can clip that right off. I recommend doing this again, just one at a time. Keep it nice and simple and easy. Okay, it will require a little bit of extra uh, threading of the needle, but you will have thanked yourself for taking the extra effort here. One recommendation that I can do is to have your needle positioned and strung through the beads that you're wanting to pass that thread through. And then going in and putting it through the eye. That way you have it all ready to go and all you have to do is just pull it tight. Once I've done that, I can again just go back in and trim it. As such, so I've got the one, or rather two, I guess, once I end up cutting it, pieces of thread here left. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow your all's mind and try and do two threads at a time. Oops, I should have cut it this way. There we go. Okay, let's see if I can do two. <laughs> this is not for the faint of heart. We're going to really challenge ourselves here. Ooh, I can do two, okay. Whew, it's a nice thing about four pound fire line here. So I'll just simply sew that through. Um, I might go through a couple of these beads at the same time. Let's see if I can do this, okay. There we go. Sew it right through. Okay, and then just simply trim it off. I know that's a lot of thread sorting um, that you gotta do, but again, for the, the love of the project, <laughs> here I've made a matching end cap. Um, this, is, this is gonna be the way to go to really get a slick design down. So I've made a second end cap there. And um, I've got some beads set out to do another end cap. Um, but thanks to TV Magic, I've already made one. Now, the thing with this is that you got to make a bunch of end caps, right? Because, there we go, that's me nodding it, um, which I've already done for you guys. Um, you got to make a bunch of end caps because that's what the pattern calls for. Uh, especially if you're making all three sets. For the necklace, you just need two. So I'm going to set those aside and I'm going to show you guys how to start the centerpiece of the necklace. And if you're confused on the end cap, you can definitely go back and replay and watch the illustrations again. Um, but essentially this is what we've made. And this is what we're going to do next because these ends work a little bit differently. Okay, so I'm going to grab some more fire polish and have those out. You could some, certainly dump all of this into um, some bead trays here if you want to, just to make it easy. Um, and again, just counting it out ahead of time is always helpful. For the necklace itself, um, there are, again, 57 involved, which if you subtract 12 from that, I can't do quick math, but it's a lot. So I'm just going to dump some out here. <laughs> I'm going to go with it. There we go. All right, for the fire line, to make the centerpiece, I am just going to give myself a good full yard to work with. 
probably a yard and a half actually to be on the safe side. The uh, centerpiece takes quite a bit to work with. So, and you want to find a length of fire line that you're comfortable with working and uh, not tangling it up. For me, a yard and a half is sort of the maximum. The two yards, just count me out of that because that's going to definitely cause some issues and some uh, imbalance in my <laughs> in my um, stitching. So again, threading it through the needle. I'm gonna pull it all the way down, give myself a pretty good tail and I am ready to start stitching. Now, the thing with this is I want my, my um, pipe chain to be handy because we're gonna start to stitch onto it. And this is really where you'll need your bead stopper if you've got one. I, I you know what, I can grab one because I just saw my box here. So I'm gonna do that. There we go. It's nothing like working on the fly here. I've got some bead stoppers, check that out. Okay. You guys, we got this. We got this under control. All right. I'm going to save myself about yay much of fire line. This is probably five inches, let's say. And I'm going to apply a bead stopper here at the end as the illustration looks like. And I'm going to start with the three fire polish beads. Remember from the end cap before, the only difference is that we're not going to pull it tight on itself. We're going to start to stitch around the pipe chain. So in a way, it's a little bit of a technique builder. So go ahead and stitch on, uh, string on three fire polish beads. By the way, just look at that polish. So pretty. I love that subtle patina in these. All right, I'm going to grab my pipe chain and I'm going to go through my, up through my beads again, just like we did with the end cap. What you'll notice it do, that it'll start doing is that it's going to start wrapping around the pipe chain and that's exactly what we want it to do. It might look a little wonky at first and that's perfectly okay. Um, and you wanna be somewhere toward the middle. And, uh, and I know for sure holding all this is going to be quite tricky. So luckily we got you know, the bead stopper helping us up to a certain point. <laughs> um, but what I do is I just sort of position all this between my thumb and index finger. And uh, again, just pushing that thread right back. And I'm going to just start stringing on as we did before my gem duos. So um, I had worked originally in a counterclockwise position. So I think that's what I'll do for this one which requires me to flip around my piece here. But if that's what I'm used to for the end cap, then that's the direction that I wanna go. So I have positioned my beadwork to make sure that it's going to stitch counterclockwise. And I'm going to start picking up my gem duos as such. So point them toward me, whichever ones that, you know, and this is intended to be a random project, so just you can do random colors here. Okay, picking up a gem duo from the bottom. I'm going to string it onto my thread. I'm going to find that first fire polish bead that I need to go through. So this is getting in my way. <laughs> I'm gonna take that out for a second. There we go. And let's see, find that first fire polish. There it is. Okay, I'm gonna go through that and string that right on. After getting this first row completed, you'll be just excited to know how easy this gets to stitch. So then I'm gonna flip it around, start stringing on some more gem duos. Here we go. That. Okay, go through the fire polish that's next on the line. And then finally, I'm going to flip it around and get to this last one here. Okay. 
There we go. And now I've got all of my gem duos and my fire polished stitched around as such. Remember how to get to that next level? We're going to just go up through the second set of holes in the gem duo, just like that. All right. And now I'm going to string on my next row simply the same way. I'm going to string on gem duo, go through the top hole. And if you're feeling a little uneasy at this point, you can definitely go ahead and string that or attach that bead stopper back on to help hold everything. Okay, again, find a one that's facing toward me and I'm going to stitch as such. Just flip and stitch, that's really, that's really the key here. Looks like I'm on my last row, okay, which is this one here. And it's a close up, okay. Find another gem duo and stitch it right through. Okay, three is a magic number. Once you've stitched three, you can go to that next row. There we go. You'll notice that it starts to become fixed um, and not spinning as easily, which is good because that means it's gripping onto the pipe chain. Um, and that's kind of the cool idea of the knitted technology is that whatever's being stitched around it, on top of it, through it, it really holds in place very nicely. So the idea now is to stitch a total of seven rows. We've done two, we're on our third one. And I try and be as random as possible with our gem duos. There we go. And you'll notice that they just start to snap in place, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we wanted to do. Okay. I can sort of minimally spin this as I'm working with it. Um, and it really depends on tension. Luckily, since the beads are a lot bigger than seed beads and trying to stitch through seed beads, you can um, start to kind of pull this tight and the whole thing will sort of snap together. Um, but it's a good idea to keep an eye on your tension just in case you don't want this to get too floppy and difficult to work with. Oops. Probably the most difficult thing about this is keeping those gem duos on the table <laughs> and uh, stringing them through accordingly. Once you've kind of figured out what to do there, this should be hopefully a breeze. Okay, I finished my row there. I'm going to go up through the next one. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Looks like I'm on my way here. Okay. And you could set out three gem duos at a time if that makes it easier to count. That way you don't overstitch anything because really to go all the way around, you just need three gem duos in total. And once you get several rows on, you'll notice that this starts to really become nice and tight all the way around. All right, there we go. Okay, we're ready to advance to that next level. So there we go. Okay. 
Okay, stitch this through. Count out three gem duos. One, two, three. Have them face correctly upward, bevel side up. Oops, of course I would have dropped it. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, I'm gonna spin this around so that I get around to this other side that I haven't stitched yet. It's really just a matter of repetition at this point. Um, you'll notice that it's the same technique for the earrings as well, because all you're doing is just building the amount of gem duos on top of each other from there. Okay. To the next level. I feel like I'm reaching seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got one more row before we can do the next step here. Okay, we'll count out one, two, and three. One. Two, last one here, three. All right, so we have got a total of seven rows and I'm going to go ahead and advance my thread forward to that next row. And we are ready to add our centerpiece. Um, stick, for the lack of a better term, <laughs> which is this right here. Okay, to do this, you'll simply slide that down, and you are going to just basically stitch right over it. Let's see, so there we are. And what you'll do is just kind of ignore it out of the way as best as you can. You can kind of tuck it in between, but you see how that's going to give a hidden sort of uh, head pin, if you will, to kind of work with to attach stuff to. Um, that's really the idea there. So once I've done that, I can proceed and count out some more gem duos. So I'm gonna work with threes three, I'm gonna string one on and resume my stitching and just kind of ignore that simple loop. Okay, there's one. And we'll string another one. Here's number two. Neela, can you um, move up some? People were saying sometimes you end up off camera. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Your comments are being heard, friends. <laughs> Okay, and one more. There we go. So I'm ready to go on to that next level. You could see that I'm really just ignoring my little stick there, the wire and just doing my best to stitch around it. Now, luckily, you don't have to do this for the bracelet. It will, um, it will not be required for the bracelet. This is really just for the necklace. It's a lot of things to hold on to, but I know you guys can do this. Once it's stitched in place, it's fairly simple to work around. So again, I will, whoops. String these three. One. And I'll basically complete seven more rows. That way I'll have 
an even number here, but I can definitely count and make sure that I do. Two. Three. Okay, again, I'm just gonna move on to the next level here as such. It's pretty repetitive at this point. Um, as you can see, the only real difference again is that we've just added a little um, stem to our centerpiece there. But man, isn't that a gorgeous color combination? I didn't intentionally mean to put three <laughs> of my gem duo colors in a row there, but uh, I'll make sure to kind of skip that the next time that way. We have something different going there. Okay. One. Two. And last but not least is three. Oh, this is looking so gorgeous. Look at that. Can't wait to put my decorative bead on. So I need some more gem duos real quick. And we will proceed by going to the next row. So I'll just simply go through the top holes of my gem duo. Okay. Actually, let's see, this one. All right. Two and whoops, three. Okay. Probably should count how many rows I need to make here. So I've got three at the bottom here. That is where my little pin is exiting from. So I'll probably wanna just balance it out on the other side, um, which may end up changing the count of my gem duos, but that's okay. Cause I really just want this to be as symmetrical as possible. So it looks like I'll need to do maybe a couple more rows and that should put me where I need to be. So let's do that. All right. Go up through here. String one, and then two. And then my third one here, here we go. Brilliant, okay. So again, I'm looking at where my stem's exiting and it looks like I've got three that's lined out there and then I'll just need one more row and then my fire polish beads. So that should put us pretty good. as a centerpiece here. Okay, one. And then two. And 
And last but not least is three. And then our time for our fire polish. Perfect. Okay, go ahead and advance to that next row, which is right up there. And looks like I'll have some extra thread left over for another end cap, but that means we're in good shape if we haven't used all of it up. All right, I'm just gonna go through each of those top holes with the fire polish bead. And this is going to kind of round out the bead work there and keep it nice and tidy there at the ends. Cool, cool. So does anyone remember how we finished out our end cap? We're gonna pretty much do the same thing here. We're going to create a loop simply by going back through all of our beadwork there and the holes at the top. Uh, but we're going to leave a little loop so that we can tie our thread to itself. You know, and then the other alternative is to, of course, not do that and stitch back to back through the work to meet your thread here in the beginning, and then you could just tie it all together. Um, that is totally your preference, whatever you want to do, whatever you're most comfortable with. For me, I am just comfortable with making individual knots everywhere, um, but that might not be everyone's cup of tea, and that's perfectly okay. One, and then one, two, and give it a good tug. Nice thing about Fireline is that because it's kind of a grittier thread, it's going to hold pretty well with the knots. Um, since it's got that texture to it, that's almost wire-like. Okay, I'm going to trim this ends off that, my trusty cutters that I use for everything. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, you can kind of just tuck all this stuff back in. I wonder if I could do three at a time, or is that just too crazy? That might be too crazy. We'll do two, just two at a time. Okay, and then let's see. Go in with these, and then I'll just cut it all off at once. There we go. I don't know when I started being able to just be that comfortable with thread, though. Like, it's always been... I started off doing bead weaving before even bead stringing. I had no idea any of the bead stringing stuff. I didn't know about beading wire. I didn't know about crimps. I didn't know, like thread was my language. Thread and seed beads. And at that time, the smaller, the better. I could stitch up to size 15 seed beads with no problems. Can't really do that anymore. <laughs> but it was so fun uh, when I remember back on it. And it's kind of nice to be able to visit bead weaving in a different way. At least hopefully something a little easier than size uh, 15 seed beads. So I'm just gonna scooch those over to the side and I'm gonna go ahead and start to um, tie up this end. Now, before I do that, I think what I wanna do is measure and make sure that this is all in the middle here and it's still kind of movable, which is nice. So I'm just gonna make sure that my ends meet accordingly. And then I can go back and kind of really tighten this as I please. I could have, I guess, tied this in the beginning. I didn't even think about that. Um, so that's 
obviously some uh, it could be an option. Okay, let's see if I can get this to actually go through the needle first. Here we go. You know, the other alternative that I didn't think about is using the thread zapper. Um, and I don't think I've actually got one, but I've seen the thread zapper at work and it seems like a handy tool to have, especially for the knot tires out there. Or you know what, instead of tying this, I guess I could show you guys how to stitch the entire piece of thread back into the needlework here, into the beadwork. Um, that might be, a good excuse to just at least show you guys another way to complete this. What I recommend doing is having at least about five inches of thread and then circling back through the beadwork a couple times and then going in and stitching through the gem duos and just going about an inch or an inch and a half into your beadwork should be sufficient enough. The thing with this is that it's not supporting weight and because it's not supporting weight, the tension is not on it to unravel. And um, the heavy lifting, the, the silver silk is doing the heavy lifting here. So you don't really have to worry about it coming apart. And especially if you've gone that in, de uh, in detail with the beadwork, through the beadwork, then you should be pretty golden. So there we go. I did one with tying knots and did one without. <laughs> How's that for mixed media? All right. At least I had some justification around it, right? So we have got our little stem all stitched up, you guys. So there's that and that. All right. So um, before we get around to completing this design, let's go ahead and stitch up our ends here. Excuse me, finish up our ends here. Do you remember those pieces that I mentioned earlier, the inch and a half? pieces of wire. Well, now's your time to use them. We're going to be creating a simple loop here at one end. Okay, I'm just going to have it flush inside of my chain nose pliers. Um, I'm just going a little bit in, maybe maybe about, um, a, about three millimeters into the pliers. The further you go in, the bigger the loop becomes. And I'm just going to start to turn it, grip and turn until I get a nice round loop as such. And I'm going to swap with my chain nose pliers and I'm gonna go in, grab the neck and pinch it back so that I've got a central symmetrical loop here. And after I've done that, um, I wanna close that little gap. That's, uh, that's gonna bother me. Okay, there we go. After I've done that, I can grab my end cap and I'm just going to string the top right through. The top of the end cap is the one that has the closest, most closed fire polish beads. You see how open they are there? Well, choose the one that's really compressed and then go through that. And then what I'm gonna do, grab my Loctite and uh, here's the step that we're on. And we're going to apply a little bit of glue here at the stem of my um, wire. And I'm going to grab my pipe chain and I'm gonna string that right through, right over, and then make sure that my end cap is right over the pipe chain like that. And that's what creates the end, that's the magic. Isn't that just crazy? <laughs> What's nice about the pipe chain is indeed that little hole that runs through it. So now I've got this really clean tapered finish that, uh, well, not maybe tapered, but it's a clean finish. Um, and so you'll just do that with the other side. Grab my chain nose pliers, grab my other stick that I had with the wire, create a loop. Okay, break the neck, just a little bit. 
metaphorically. And um, I'm gonna pinch that in because it's gonna bother me. There we go. And grab my other end cap that I made earlier through TV Magic. Grab, whoops, my glue is already out. Just kidding, don't need to take the lid off. Apply some glue. Stick it through the tubing and boom. And give it maybe about 30 minutes to dry. It doesn't take much to dry actually, but you're ready to stick on the jump rings and clasp should you have one on hand, unlike me. And then at the bottom here, we're ready for our decorative beads. So I'm just going to string on my sparkly crystal there. I'm going to make a simple loop here at the end. I'm gonna trim this back just a little bit. Grab my round nose pliers, start to roll until the end meets. I've got a little bit of a gap there and it's just enough to bother me. So I think I'm gonna trim a little bit of my loop off, go back in with my pliers and continue rounding until I get to a point where I can't. Then I'm going to grab my chain nose pliers and bend that stem back so that the loop is nice and central. I'm going to open up that loop simply by just folding the seam upward, grabbing my little decorative bead, my little bobble, and simply pressing this back down. So there we go. We got a little magic bobble. We got a little crystal action. We've got some stitched gem duos, which look quite smart and handsome if I do say so myself there we go yeah, there we are <laughs> it's not laying flat on the table so i'm doing my best here <laughs> and we've got our ends that are all now capped off so if we had to choose which step we're on we have surpassed this this is where we would add our clasp and uh you know what just for the sake of this video why don't i do this let me grab through TV magic, the, the other end caps here and um, remove the clasp and then show you guys what that looks like. Ooh, if I had a nickel for every time I didn't have a clasp, I wonder how much side pocket money will I have made at this point? My customer and friend, Emily Prine can uh, definitely attest to me not having a clasp on hand is an ongoing joke, and yet we have still not walked away from it. There we are. There's our magic clasp, <laughs> it's magnetic. And um, let's see, we got our centerpiece all worked out. I can't wait to see what you guys pick for your centerpiece. Now let's talk about real quick the other configurations because the earrings are their own separate project. And um, it's made exactly the same way as I just showed you. There is one difference in that whenever you cut your pipe chain, um, you'll want to make sure that you cut roughly about two inches, let's just say. And instead of cutting a stick of wire, as we did earlier, what you're going to do is just string on an entire three to four inch piece and work from that. Therefore, there's no glue involved with the airing. Um, you're just simply making a simple loop once you've you know, put your end cap over it and then you're good to go. It's the same thing with the bracelet. Okay, so whenever you get your size determined of the pipe chain, you can then string on a full piece of wire. This will add structure to the entirety of the bracelet um, but then you don't have to worry about glue and stuff at the ends. You can simply just string your end cap right over it and make your simple loops there as we did earlier. Um, pretty easy stuff. Here's the finished piece for that. As you can see, I added some bobbles there at the end with the magnetic clasp, but it is truly just a smaller version of the necklace design that we finished up. Pretty fun. And I do love this colorway. Um, I was so excited to stitch with the red and the blue just because I needed some extreme color in my life. 
So I am going to pop around to this project. I'm gonna pop my face back around. <laughs> Let me come on the right side of the camera here. And because it's a live show, I'm just gonna scroll through some of these comments real quick. Okay, my TGBE sister is in the house, says really, uh, uh, project is so fantastic. Uh, really lovely, Neelay. Thank you, my darling friend. And we've got Miss Suzanne Brown in the house. Says awesome. Uh, Janelda says beautiful, lovely. To I see all my friends here. My former TGBE friend, uh, Kelly Sun. Oh, it's just my partner in crime, really. Like we do all the things together. <laughs> lovely to see you here, Kelly. I'm glad you could pop in. And we've got Miss Carmen it says, love, love, love. Um, hopefully I've answered some questions. Jennifer, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> this is Neelay's a genius. You're the genius, my friend. Thank you so much for tuning into this show. Hopefully um, I've added some clarity to the instruction set. Neelay, I do have two or three questions written down. Oh, let's do it. What what are uh, the questions? I'll see. If okay, I can let's them. see. Um, first one: um, Can this be done on your knitted leather chains and capture chains? Oh, isn't that the question of the week? So, um, speaking of leather knitted cord, that is a brand new product that I've been toying with and experimenting, and it is now a solid color in the silver silk chain collection. And the answer is yes, yes, you can do that to the leather cords. Um, as long as they're around the same size of the pipe chain, the reason that they need to be the same size is that otherwise the gem duos will just clasp in on themselves. If the leather cord is too big, um, you know, if you grab a three millimeter leather cord or a four one, you're going to see a lot of spacing between each of those gem duos and you'll see a lot more thread. So the right size is truly the key. And so the pipe chain, if, if the, and it is the leather cord that I carry in the silver silk line is the same size as the pipe chain, it's going to just stitch up beautifully. It's, they would just have to make adjustments to the end caps though, right? For the... Not really. I, well, I mean... yeah, I guess that's true. Sorry. Yes. Because the end caps are meant to work for the pipe chain. Um, but you can use the silver silk single strand end caps um, instead. And you know what? Over in the Silkies group, um, I know that some folks have already started making this project. And I think I saw one of them use pinch cord ends um, that weren't silver silk, but it still worked. And then the next question is, can you make the centerpiece separately then slide over the pipe chain? Um, it's tricky because yes and no. You can do that to the bracelet potentially. The problem is, is that once you stitch halfway over, whoops, I should probably show what I'm saying. <laughs> Once you've stitched halfway over, it's very difficult to put the piping on or the centerpiece through. Um, once, you know, and also because once you get the centerpiece stick in, it's going to be nearly impossible to put that on later. So I recommend if you are able to stitch directly onto the pipe chain, it's going to make life a little easier, um, especially when, when doing all of this. And you could see that even the spacing isn't perfect. It has to have a little bit of organic room to move and shift around, sort of like tectonic plates, if you will. So if everything is closed up so tightly, then it's going to be more difficult to push this through. And one last question. If yeah. you're working on the centerpiece and you run out of thread, how do you add more thread? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the answer is just cut enough thread. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joan's laughing in the background. Um, what you can do is go in here. I'm going to demonstrate with a little bit of stuff here. Because this is important. This is important to the people that are new to bead weaving. I'm going to thread on a needle and show you how I would do it. And then um, we can take a little break and we have a ask me anything over on the Great Beat Extravaganza page. All right, so let's say that our thread exits here. Uh, and to do this, I really need to demonstrate this properly. So I need to get like the right stuff here sorted through.
well, let's just say I've got a little piece of thread that sticks out here and I'm wanting to add more gem duos onto this side. What I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to leave my thread kind of out there. I'm gonna use a bead stopper here in a minute, but what I'll do is I'll start myself with a new piece of thread right next to where I'm about to stitch onto. I will secure a row if I have the availability and if I don't, then I will just come up through whatever I can. And what I would do in this situation is I would use a thread, a bead stopper to stop my working thread. And now I've got my extra piece of thread here that I'm wanting to add on to, right? So what you can do is tie these together. That way you kind of have a seamless um, piece of thread that you're about to work with. Hopefully that kind of covers what I would do in this situation. Um, and again, this is one of those things that's just nice to tie off and tuck back in later. And you don't even have to tuck it in. In fact, you can kind of just put it, butt it up against the pipe chain and stitch right over it. And it's pretty much tucked in anyway. Um, but you can then create a square knot like usual and then just ignore it out of the way and then continue your stitch work after taking the bead stopper back off. Does that make sense? Hopefully, <laughs> for the folks uh, that are asking about that. I know that's a little extra lesson there, um, but I will say if you work with a yard and a half of thread, you should be pretty golden. All right, so I'm gonna pop over back to my face here. And I wanna thank you guys for joining in. Oh, get on the right side here. <laughs> I wanna thank you guys for joining in for this tutorial. I hope you find it educational, something new to learn and try and do. And um, you can grab the kit from silversilkonline.com. If you are interested, you will also get a set of digital instructions. Why? The reason is, is that we all learn differently. I learn through hand on, hands on, getting in there. And uh, I don't read so much, which is ironic that I also created the instructions as a written format. But I know folks out there like to read about the design and get all of the diagrams and stuff. And that's there for you. So now you have an audio lesson, you have a visual lesson, and you will have the pattern that you can read. And um, if you have any other questions, you can absolutely email me. Um, orders at silversilkonline.com. And I will do my best to get to those emails and answer those questions as efficiently as I possibly can. I am a one man show for the Silver Silk brand. I do everything from product creation and manufacturing to the marketing and the live videos and the educational stuff. But Joan helps me out quite a bit. And then we've got Teresa also, who is our brand ambassador for the Silver Silk Silkies Facebook group. So I've got a little bit of help behind me um, steaming the engines, but otherwise uh, we're, we're very small here, very intimate, I like to say, as a company. Um, and you will get definitely a response from me or from Joan, depending on where you ask the question. So um, again, I leave you inspired, invigorated, hopefully um, some excitement throughout this great beat extravaganza event that's going on. And um, the presenters are just so fabulous. So take advantage of this time and of all of the different things that you can learn. And um, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you are there. Um, tell people about it. If you enjoy this content, let me know in the comments because that stuff is important. I love feedback. Uh, I, I want to improve on these videos and I want to give you guys what you want with Silver Silk. <laughs> all right. So. Mwah. Enjoy the day. I love all of you so much, and I will catch you again soon at the next tutorial. Bye.